Afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar that we're hosting at Credit Strategy, uh, looking at the business case for agility in collections uh, during but also beyond COVID-19. Uh, my name is Marcel Leguay. I'm the host for today's discussion, and I'll introduce our panelists, which you can hopefully all see uh, in just a second. So just to give you a, a kind of general overview, the, the kind of topic we're looking at is the extent to which um, collections firms and creditors have been able to be agile and how quickly they've been able to transform in all sorts of ways, but particularly in the uh, in the, in the ways in which they're using technology since around about March the 21st, when the lockdown restrictions first took effect. So we're going to look at examples of how that's played out in practice um, and relate that to a survey that we I undertook throughout kind of June uh, and a bit of uh, July as well. But we're looking at how firms have been able to be agile now while they're offering payment holidays, while they're transitioning to work from home policies and working out all the different options that have to be offered uh, to customers depending on their circumstances and working out how, how fluid those circumstances uh, actually are. And that's in this kind of slightly bizarre period we're in now where kind of lots of different things are being paused uh, for a certain amount of time. So I guess another important point of context is that one of the particular unique features of this recession that we're kind of only really just getting into at the moment is the scale and velocity with which some of these changes have been made. Um, it's all happened at the same time and at such scale that you you kind of had to guess that the industry had not really been uh, through anything remotely like this before, even though that the kind of tail end of uh, 2008 and 2009, there might be things um, to learn from uh, from way back when. So we're looking at those transformations and how the pandemic and all its different uh, fluctuations and effects has been a catalyst for change in the way uh, collections operations are using technology, what they're investing in and what they're deploying. So before I get into some of the details um, of the of the survey that we undertook and the agenda for today, I'll enable the panel to introduce themselves. So the good thing is you can see here is that we're getting different perspectives today um, from lenders, from providers of collections technology and from the debt purchase world too. So we're getting the kind of inside track on what the change has been for those uh, issuing support, I guess, for mortgage customers, for those uh, who have unsecured borrowing as well, uh, from the car finance world, uh, from the collections technology world, and from debt purchase too. So, Nick, if I come to you first on this, uh, what might be worth doing, as well as kind of giving the audience an overview of your role, if it's even possible to pinpoint one particular thing, one top of the agenda item uh, that your collections teams are now grappling with? Sure. So um, in terms of introduction, uh, as it says there, Nick Winterbottom, I'm head of customer support and for Virgin Money UK. So that comprises the Virgin Money brand, Clydesdale Bank and Yorkshire Bank brand. So. Um, that the remit stretches across that as part of that remit it's secured and unsecured uh, collections and recoveries but I also look after fraud from application fraud through to financial crime money laundering etc and then on to vulnerable customers and bereavement services so very much in the eye of the storm over the last uh, three months very um, much so. I, I, th I think in terms of the, the, the one thing that I would um, pinpoint is the, is the thing that we've grappled with apart from volume and the speed of change and the kind of um the, the level of change over that period of time i think it, it, it's it's helping colleagues adapt to a level of uncertainty because at the same time as we're dealing with customers who are facing uncertainty we're not immune from it um so our colleagues are facing exactly the same thing there's a level of fear in there um, in terms of the, the, the risk of the virus itself, but also now as we emerge into phase two and phase three of all of this, what does the future hold in terms of working practices and how am I going to adapt? So I think it's just being able to provide to provide a level of certainty and operate in the grey 
through a period of, of, of change has been probably the one thing we've all had to adapt to. Yeah, I bet that resonates with quite a few of the audience. So, uh, Richard, same question to you. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I, I won't give you my title, it's on there on the screen. So, um, working with the PSA group uh, covering captive finance, Peugeot, Citroën, and DS brands. Uh, been in the industry collections specific for, for around 10 years now. Um, obviously, never dealt with anything such as this. Um, I guess, in terms of challenges right now, um, it, it's really what what the new normal looks like, what normality looks like. Um, of course, we've we've finished in some regard the kind of special measures now in terms of the task force that was set up to to deal with payment breaks and 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 those those high volume requests. And we're now trying to develop into what does the new normal look like? What will BAU look like? And we're starting to see now and, and, and starting to grapple with the whole working from home scenario when trying to deliver the usual KPIs and grade of service that, that our customers expect. So of course, everyone struggled. There were challenges for everyone in terms of call centers and dealing with volume. And I think there's an expectation now that that's, that's falling away, that the, the, the initial bulk has been dealt with. So the expectation is that we get back to normal in terms of offering the, 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 the services that people are used to. But of course, we've still got many people working from home um, and that brings its own challenges. Um, it's clearly in some regards not as efficient as working from the office. So it's striking that balance between doing right by the, the, uh, the members of the public and doing right by the employees, but also doing right by the customers as well. Um, so I think that's the challenge in terms of how you, how you grapple with that, with that new normal, because we're never going to go back really to, to how it was before. Um, and I guess I, the, the only thing I'd, I'd, I'd add to that in, in terms of the rest of, of today is that you know, views, and, views and comments are, are my own and, and, and not my company's, um, but certainly in terms of what we see moving forward, it's going to be a very different world, not only for collections, but I think for everyone. That's very true. It, yeah, I, don't, I can't think of any sector really that's unaffected uh, in terms of scale and pace of change at the moment. So. Uh, Terry, coming uh, to you next on this, I guess it's obviously different as a um, technology service provider, but um, maybe if you could give us uh, an overview of your role, but your observations and the challenges for your business too. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Marcel. Um, so, yeah, I'm specifically uh, responsible for growing our software business across Europe, UK, and I. Um, Prior to joining Qualco, I spent many years consulting as well, so I, I've, I've had a lot of experience on the call front. Um, this pandemic, the situation that we're in now, is, is unprecedented, um, as you've already said. But, but I think, kind of, if I just go back to some of the fundamentals, data, analytics, and software in the collections environment, though, those components, now more than ever, and bringing them together and getting value from the data that you're seeing as a consequence of the uh, uh, the pandemic, being able to apply analytics to that data to differentiate how and where you're going to treat customers and then being able to adapt quickly your um, operational processes um, and your deployments across the operation are absolutely fundamental. So we've seen the demand for quickly responding digitally be able to make a request for holiday payments, for example, right the way through to who, who is actually going to be impacted as we start to unwind from some of the measures that are in place. I, I know Richard Sunak announced some additional measures yesterday, um, and, and that's going to prolong um, kind of the, the situation for many individuals. But over the course of the next six to 12 months, the actual overall impact, I think, is, is, is yet to be understood to any level of degree. No. It's going to be fundamental that organisations can adapt quickly and, and quickly adjust their strategies and the way they interact with their customers in order to get, you know, suitable resolution for everybody. Yeah, I think that's true. It's this kind of agility that's being imposed upon firms by the, the, the wider circumstances. So just coming to you last, uh, Derek, um, what's the general perspective um, from your role as kind of leading a, a debt purchase business? I think there's a lot of commonality with what everyone else has said so far. Um, probably a, a slight difference for us is that 
you know, we're um, dealing with customers who are already, you know, fairly deep into arrears um, on a on a day to day basis. Um, so the you know much, probably a bit less change than than for some people, other than the working from home and all of that sort of stuff. What we found though was that um, we took some very quick actions at the beginning to slow down and stop quite a lot of what we were actually doing and really just respond to inbound demand from our customers. Uh, what was interesting was that it was so much harder to restart the, those uh, activities and uh, you know, needing, needing new data to inform us um, about you know, the current position of our customers. Um, was uh, was was really right at the top of the list. So um, it's yeah, it's been a it's been a challenging um, challenging time. Uh, but yeah, the data um, and thinking about our you know our response um, and in the way we restart the business has been been right at the top of the list. Yeah, I can imagine. I think it, I think that will resonate with quite a lot of the audience in terms of trying to establish when so many customers are in fluid circumstances, the up-to-date picture of their, of their financial circumstances. Um, so thanks to the panel uh, for joining us. And what I can do now is start um, taking the audience through what we're gonna be exploring, discussing today. So as I mentioned earlier, we conducted an industry-wide study uh, with our partners at Qualco through the majority of June and just about into the beginning of July as well. And that was to ascertain some of the, some of the practicalities of what I mentioned earlier. So this was the kind of trends around volumes coming into collections, first of all, in inbound calls, kind of challenges encountered when companies had to change, had to transition to work from home in a matter of weeks. Some managed it in days, I think. Um, also the areas of focus in collections technology. So where creditors and collections firms are placing their emphasis on which functions within the collections operation needed that change and how quickly they needed to do that change. But also importantly, because we wanted the results of the survey to enable uh, the industry to benchmark to a certain degree is how successful they rate um, the changes that they have made so far. So really the results of this survey, which we're showing you exclusively today for the first time, form the backbone of the discussion. And alongside that, I'll get the panelists' reflections on those results, but talk about their own experiences too. So just uh, delving a bit more deeper into the, the full agenda. For today. So we'll look at these, what the results show about how inbound call trends are playing out in collections. Some of the more precise specific challenges in that work from home transition and the precise areas where new technology has been deployed or where it's been upgraded some of the familiar answers that came up were digital comms a call center tech automation payment technology and you can kind of anticipate some of those would have come up anyway as lots of companies were working out which agents could work from home compliantly and take payment securely and I guess oversee personal information compliantly too uh, and where people were looking at how to help and automate the process for people to request and apply and effectively in some way self-cert for payment holidays. But alongside that we'll look at how quickly people have been able to make those changes whether that's um, actual more hefty investment in new software or whether it's been upgrades or just kind of doing things differently uh, with what an existing provider uh, can service them with so quite importantly to link it back to the one of the fundamental premises of hosting the webinar as well is looking at budget allocations or collections functions within lenders particularly and whether finally this eventually is a time at which those allocations are increasing and if they are increasing where those budgets are most likely to be deployed and also we've touched on this already some shifts have been made that will remain permanent and this is most likely to be in the flexible working practices the working from home days in office etc 
that really don't seem likely to go back. And this was echoed even, I think, by um, the Barclays chief exec who said himself not too long after lockdown that the days of thousands of people being in offices is probably a thing of the past. So before we get into the specifics of the results, just a, a quick encouragement to ask questions on your control panel uh, to the panel today. Uh, happy for you to post observations as well. We're coming to a Q&A session towards the end of the broadcast. Um, but in as things kind of emerge, as things um, are pointed out to you, we do encourage them to come in during uh, during the webinar. We also have two or three interactive polls for you. The more of you take part in them, and the more meaningful results we can then display to you. And lastly, a kind of neat new feature of the platform that we're using is that you can actually join this discussion in person. And it's quite easy to do. If you look at your control panel on the right hand side, this kind of vertical uh, dark gray bar, you'll see that what should be an orange arrow at the top. If you look towards the bottom of that, there should be a field to ask questions. And there should be a field there to raise a digital hand. And if you raise a digital hand, that's a prompt for me to unmute you, which I can do. And you can literally just talk to our panel in person. And hopefully that will allow you to um, get some more precise information that you might be looking for. Also, a quick point on if you're asking a question just remotely, if you're just punching a question in, just to give us your company and your job title, as that enables us to kind of get a clear picture of where you might be coming from with your question. So just uh, one last point is just to let you know that like all broadcasts uh, for organisations like us, it's being done remotely from our homes. So please do excuse any uh, typical household noises that might emerge, children moaning about what's for lunch, etc. Um, so I think we can now, now that I've done all the housekeeping, kind of display for you one of the first scene setting questions that we asked um, the industry. So to give you an idea is that the kind of the nature of companies that responded to this was a mixture of some of the largest lenders out there, such as Lloyd's, and a mixture of kind of the medium sized collections organisations uh, at the moment. And the point at which they answered this was during June. So whenever we're looking at comparisons, we're looking at the majority of June compared to May. And this one, as you can see, was about inbound call volumes, how they were trending throughout June compared to May. And I guess what this shows is that while you might have reasonably expected um, a peak in April, you're still seeing quite a few, seeing more during June compared to May, because you've got roughly over a third there, around 33, 34%, still seeing higher inbound volumes uh, compared to May, only a slim majority seeing lower, and roughly uh, just below 30% uh, seeing the same, same amount. So historically, uh, these calls are still high for the majority of people. Uh, just before we go to a next result, which is related to this, I wanted to ask a quick poll, which is basically the same question. So give a few seconds and this will appear on your screen. So it's pretty much the same question, but asking about a different period. For the 30 days leading up to where we are today, July the 9th, looking for a rough estimate of whether inbound call volumes have been trending higher, lower, or about the same. So I'm just looking for the results to come in. I know that some of you might not have the results to hand, so we're just looking at a general estimate. So just giving you a few more seconds. It looks like a substantial majority, 55% I'm seeing, are witnessing about the same level of inbound calls compared to the 30 days leading up to the beginning of June. And it's roughly equal 24% and 20, roughly around 24, 25% seeing lower or higher, but you're still seeing, there's no alleviation from what this uh, from what this poll is showing us. 
So just to let you know that these slides and some of the poll results will be available in a, in a recording, an on-demand version of this afterwards. So for kind of clarity, if you want to catch up on what these results show, it will all be available for you uh, after the event. But that's the kind of situation for uh, the respondents to the survey and you at home, but it will be good to get the panelists' views on this now. So, uh, Richard, as a car finance provider, how are these inbound call volumes trending at the moment? At a rough estimate, is there any sign of them slowing? Yeah, well, I guess it depends how far back you look. But so, in in terms of historic volumes, then they are still uh, higher by some margin. Um, but in terms of the recent peaks, in terms of the, the original tranche of requests, then certainly the yeah they've, they've dropped off and the volume has reduced. Um, obviously, there's, there's lots of nuances in there. Um, when the announcement was made initially by the regulator on on the uh, steps that will be taken to allow customers to have a payment break from their mortgage, then we immediately saw collections, uh, sorry, uh, calls into our business increase as well because the uh, expectation by some or the understanding by some was that um, this would apply or did already apply to the wider finance industry. So we immediately saw those start to increase. Um, and obviously we had that period in between where we had to manage the, the kind of message because we, well, everyone had their own views on whether, you know, the personal loans, credit cards, um, car finance would go the same way, whether the guidance would follow the same route. And we had to kind of make our own minds up on that um, for, for that interim period whilst the guidance came out. And obviously once that, once that came out into the public domain, then of course you have the, the spike of requests. But from a collection point of view, of course, the majority of the increase wasn't there. It was in customer services because these were customers predominantly who were up to date, who had had a good payment history, were concerned about the impact or were already feeling an impact of COVID-19 and therefore they're requesting the payment break to alleviate that kind of that kind of situation. Um, so really the increase was there. That's where the task force was established to help maintain uh, the service levels and, and deal with that volume. Um, and now, I guess, in, in the later stages, now we're into the, the second phase, if you like, the guidance, you know, uh, differs slightly, or should I say the draft guidance differs slightly. So we're, we're in a position now where we're in that transition. There'll be some customers that can resume payments, some that are, are, are ringing now concerned where they're still on a payment break. They're not due to make a payment yet, but they're, they're concerned about what happens next. What are you going to do or what can you do? And again, to some extent, we're kind of waiting a little bit to see you know what what we're, we're asked to do and what the regulator guides us to do um so again we're, we're kind of managing that message with with customers but in principle the question absolutely the peak's done uh, we're still on increased volume but we're at manageable levels now and, and we're resuming some semblance of normality now okay and nick what's been the situation um i guess when you're as a lender you're dealing with mortgage payment holiday requests and other payment requests on other products on the credit cards etc is it possible i guess to get a picture on which of which of those calls are starting to alleviate or is it just high volume still across the board i, I think i think it's very much as, as richard described uh, i think the probably the two observations i'd have is that the speed of the surge around the 16th 17th of march was incredible i think we went overnight from 250 calls in a day on on mortgages to approaching 2000 uh within literally on the back of the announcement and i think what we've seen is a clear lag between mortgages and the reaction of customers and the inbound that's gone through a peak volumes are still high but that's driven by our exit activity so high versus the the kind of history we've seen but um certainly lower than the peak and to an extent we can control that a bit more on the exit um it's less reactive um and then from a um, an unsecured perspective we've just seen that lag as the guidance takes a while to to catch up customers are responding to that um, and then we're starting to see that that traffic flow in so we we essentially have waves of activity hitting the team and i think one of the things that we've also seen from a collections point of view is because this is at the at its root about financial difficulty be it short term or long term those calls have landed with us 
even though 99% of those customers weren't in arrears um, and probably won't be after this either. So it's just how we've chosen to respond as an organization is, is much more in the collection space, which brings with it its own challenges. Yeah, and when, I don't know if you have an estimate of these uh, figures, but when the kind of first round of mortgage payment holidays came to uh, expiry, do you have a sense of the proportion of those that were extended? Or was it that the three months was kind of sufficient for them, for, for most of them? Um, we're starting to get that sense. I think we're in the situation now where the wave one of maturities has started to um, to, to come through. I, I think it's probably a bit early for me to to to, to call out yeah. what the result is. Um, and but I, I think we're seeing the majority of customers resume um, payments. I think it's probably the kind of Pareto rule, <laughs> the 80-20 yeah. rule, that's kind of saying that we're going to see a, a proportion of these customers then roll on to the next one. I think the challenge now is how you adapt the exit strategy to deal with the fact that what if you if you get down to a smaller proportion of customers on a payment holiday, this becomes more respect in the space of um, pre-delinquency because what we've got is the coincidence of the end of payment holidays and the end of furlough and other government support schemes, which to an extent creates the cliff edge we're all worried about. Um, and payment holidays or payment deferrals, particularly on mortgages, aren't there anymore because we've just done that for those customers. So it's how we respond and, and be very proactive through this next period to, to prevent an emergence of arrears. Yeah, so I mean, it's that cliff edge, very difficult to depict. I mean, it looks enormous at the moment, it, just looking at the the numbers on the face of it from the Treasury. So the, I think the most recent ones were just a couple of days ago. So it's something like just over 12 million people of whose salaries of around, uh, I think it was over 30 billion are being covered in part obviously by the government. And of course, all of that ending, conspiring to end all at the same time, really. So you you would expect that the Treasury Bank of England and FCA are going to going to be meeting to determine how vast that cliff edge might be in the scale of it. I think. Um, so just lastly on this point, I'll come to you, Derek, because I mean I know naturally as a debt purchaser your calls are going to be outbound in the in the main. But maybe if you could give us a picture on the kind of how active your collections teams have been uh, since lockdown, the, the kind of volumes that you've been dealing with. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I would have had the same perception, by the way, between our outbound and inbound. Um, okay. But uh, normal, you know, normal run of the mill is probably 60% inbound, um, you know, with customers choosing to be, you know, sort of proactive um, about uh, resolving um, their, their arrears. Um, we we did see a spike. I mean, we saw, but what we saw was actually probably more of a swap of activity. So less people being proactive about uh, resolving their arrears, and more people phoning up to say, "Look, I, I can't start payments yet. I need a payment break." Or people phoning up to say, "Look, I'm, you know, I'm paying you twenty pounds or fifty pounds or whatever it might be, uh, but you know, I've just been furloughed or I've just been made redundant. Um, I need a payment break until I see how this." all works out so so actually we we saw a bit of a spike but nothing like you know sort of primary lenders um and and in fact actually you know subsequent to that very short initial spike we've actually had much lower inbound volumes um and sort of actually been you know sort of trying to build the business back to to the same amount of inbound as we had uh, prior it's, it's probably only about now that we're getting back to that sort of normal level of inbound volume okay well i guess that's kind of a, a comprehensive view there of uh, uh, trends around inbound calls at the moment so what we'll do now is kind of move on to some of these other results um that the survey um threw up for us so this is around the kind of challenges encountered when firms were transitioning to work from home and we've covered quite a bit of this already so some of these you'd expect to come up really 50 percent of those surveyed mentioned it laptops wi-fi connectivity etc uh, one highlighting call recording issues but call recording came up quite a bit 
Uh, going into some lower proportions there, uh, the 20 quarter of the respondents, 25 percent, talked about managing staff welfare, uh, general mental health and well-being of remote agents. So I guess it's important for those agents that are dealing with higher volume. Quite a few of those customers they're speaking to might have been uh, plunged into vulnerable circumstances. So looking after their welfare when normal life for them is kind of cut off anyway. Um, interestingly enough, just one company of all the survey respondents already had home working policies with IT set up already in place. So you're looking at the vast majority uh, of the industry that we, in we surveyed anyway, are coming up against that issue of having to uh, work to a policy that had never been enacted before. So just a few more anecdotal references here, some freehand answers. Uh, we talked to this about this already, being able to deal with the increase in volume. Uh, supporting team members after difficult calls, this must have been a challenge for many. Uh, Ofcom compliance was already com complicated as it was before any restrictions took hold or any transition policies had to be implemented. So that's probably added another layer of complexity. Productivity of staff and call quality monitoring as well. And I kind of wonder the extent to which managing speech analytics remotely would have been a challenge for many as well. So just coming uh, lastly on to one particular answer that probably would resonate quite a lot, which is um, about guidance around payment holidays. So one of the respondents mentioned you know, acting on the now and not the future. Payment holidays are temporary and there hasn't been much guidance on the future. I think I'll just um, do a quick question on this to, uh, to, uh, to Nick first, maybe, I guess, with the speed with which payment holiday guidance has come out so far on all the various different products, would you expect any further guidance to emerge uh, in, with reference to whether it's mortgages or products on the unsecured side that kind of helps you manage the exit of these payment holidays later this year? Or is it, or do you, does it seem to be the case that the guidance will remain as it is for the foreseeable? Yeah, I, I think the guidance um, is likely to remain as it is. I, I think, and, and I, I suspect the regulator would say it's guidance. Um, and not rules. So um, I, I think from our point of view, the challenge here is probably twofold. As we start to emerge into more normal, uh, a more normal period, the kind of the temporary rules around essentially being forced into um, a payment holiday or payment deferral as the primary option now gets replaced with BAU forbearance tools and, and, and that kind of ongoing support for customers. So more tailored support, more difficult conversations with customers and outcomes that may take a long time to resolve. And then tying that across the different product site because guidance and responses have been specific to secured and unsecured. And you might be in a situation where letters are landing for both products on the same doormats and pressing a customer towards paying a personal loan and deferring a payment on a mortgage, which we wouldn't normally do. So um, we'd probably offer the, 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 the counter advice. So unraveling, um, un unraveling that would be helpful if there was um, more clarity on how we tie those conflict conflicts up. But I expect that that's going to be how we interpret and adapt it internally. And those are the sorts of things we're thinking about now. Yeah. And Rich, did you have a, a view on this as well? Any extra measures of clarity that you might be hoping for from the FCA? Yeah, I mean, first, I guess it's worth saying that you have to sympathise um, as we ask customers to sympathise with us in dealing with a new situation, new processes, new guidance. We have to sympathise as well with the powers that be that we're in a crisis situation. That's quite clear, you know, nationally and globally. So when you're in a crisis, you have to act on the now. Um, you, you know, you can only take a certain amount of time to plan. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's clear that um, it, it's not a clean cut situation to offer this temporary solution and then everything goes back to normal. 
Um, clearly, what we've all said up until now is things are going to look very, very different. So I guess the the question now remains is what level of involvement will the regulation, will the guidance have on what we do in future? Will it be, as Nick's alluded to, just, OK, we're back to BAU now, get on with it, and then we as lenders have to kind of deal with that in our own way? Or will there continue to be kind of further but less intrusive kind of guidance measures just to to, to keep everyone on the same track and, and try and maintain some of that consistency? So that's the real question. But I guess when you're in a crisis, you have to um, you have to you have to deal with that as and when it comes. Yeah, it's the same for all regulators. You, you have to think. Um, so I think now what we can do is go into some of the more detail of the actual changes in collections technology that the respondents said they have been making. So we asked a kind of an open question here about the the function. Uh, the functions within collections that are getting most attention and whether that's getting attention through more hefty new investments whether it's upgrades or whether it's kind of just doing things differently from the existing provider so if you look at towards uh, the bar on this chart the third in from the right you can see there digital comms channels uh, with customers being the most frequently answered area so that's um, where so much emphasis is being placed at the moment, but quite a few others as well. So call centre dialer, that would naturally come up anyway, as call centres had to kind of reinvent themselves, and um, partially at home and partly in the office for some. So also we've got CRA data product quite high there as well. Uh, so this is, I guess, where, as Derek mentioned, um, ascertaining the up-to-date financial circumstances of customers but also there towards the left uh, third in from the left you've got automation would have been a key focus i think for many uh, lenders and creditors at the start of the year maybe the pandemic has just been a catalyst to accelerate that and also you've got collections and case management software there as well so just another note on this for clarity on what some of these bars are showing so the dark blue at the base of each uh, bar is where the kind of heftier new investments have been made uh, in new software and the one above that is where companies have upgraded from an existing provider so just going into what really some of these results show is that in the main um the majority of organizations they've been revamping existing methods and some of the really com common areas where they've done that is digital comms channels, the highest of any function. You've got to think that setting up portals for uh, payment holiday applications is, must have been a key part of that. Uh, collections of case management software, uh, call centre dialers, and some of the compliance uh, and risk uh, technologies have been up there as well as I guess companies are trying to work out how to operate call centres remotely but safely and securely. Uh, some of the other areas in which the heftier investments have been made uh, have been again digital comms channels, payment technology and again collections case management software and some of the last areas where firms have upgraded has been in automation, open banking. This might be uh, finally the year in which open banking proliferates in a way that uh, some companies have anticipated or hoped and uh, the areas generally receiving most attention i guess digital comms credit reference data and it might be the case that this is the year in which the digital journey has been harnessed and improved quite a bit in in collections so that's kind of giving you the areas in which uh, companies are placing their emphasis, but it would be worth coming to the panel on this quickly. Uh, to you first, maybe Richard, um, what areas of PSA in terms of the use of technology and collections are getting most attention at the moment? Uh, well, I mean, it has to be open banking. I mean, it's been it's been talked about so much. I hear it in, in just about every conversation. Uh, yeah. I mean, fortunately, we uh, we'd been live with open banking before the pandemic, so we'd had time to, to become familiar with it, to build our processes around it. 
um, and, and really for me it's a it's a key tool for me and for my team to ensure that we're making the best decisions and we're driving the best outcome for the customer uh, clearly there's you know I mean you, you, you see the impact in collections when customers have a, a, um, a life-changing event when they suffer something that changes their lifestyle and arguably every single person in the country has suffered that through COVID-19 obviously the impacts are, are, are wide-ranging um, so arguably the historic CRA data has a limited use because we know for a fact that everyone will have changed to some regard what's happened um, so I think open banking is a, is a fundamental and critical part of what we'll do we've built it uh, into our processes already We'll be using it as much and as frequently as possible um, to, to help us you know, make the, the right decisions. Um, in terms of the wider picture, the, the business perspective, in terms of operating remotely, uh, we have the traditional kind of BCP structure of an offsite um, you know, unit where we could uh, debunk to um, if we needed to. But of course, during a pandemic such as this, that's, that's useless. Um, I was very impressed. Um, with how quickly we managed to get the whole company and arguably globally the whole PSA finance business working remotely um, and that was due to previous uh, investments in in soft phone technology um, in centrally hosted uh, systems and technology um, so we managed to react very quickly um, more quickly than, than I thought we would do actually um, so much so that we are now rethinking and part of the plans out of the back of this is how we ensure that we make advantage of, of what we've learned and what we've demonstrated to ourselves that we can achieve remotely um, and whether we need to do what we did in the past or whether we can do it in a different way more efficiently um, and in a better way so um, so yeah we, we we reacted very well in, in, in my opinion okay I'll, I'll probably come to Terry uh, next on this because um, by virtue of being a provider you probably get this slightly more comprehensive whole of market view. So I guess a couple of things on this, which is where you're seeing um, the kind of demand for, for support, I guess, from lenders and creditors across the board and collections operations. And the second question to that is, as well as where you're seeing where their needs are and where they're coming to you for support, uh, but also, what components you've seen in place that have helped some companies make that transition slightly more efficient and faster? So kind of two questions in one there for you. Okay, there's probably a few different uh, aspects to this. So purely from a pandemic point of view, the big drivers being how do you manage operationally um, if you've got to take your, uh, your staff out of the operating centres and, and get them working from home? And that clearly is about managing the demand um, in a different way. There's also been an increase in demand because um, people very quickly were, were following uh, the guidance they were being given in terms of trying to take payment holidays, hence the demand for digital services, which is consistent with, with what we're seeing in the, the responses here to the questionnaire. Um, I also think that one of the key things around what you can do with that digital journey, such as bringing in open banking to provide the income and expense review. So if you're taking 12 months worth of transactional data from uh, a customer's bank account and using that to provide a, a much better view of their incomings and outgoings, there's only going to be a short period of that that's going to be relevant given the pandemic, but at least it gives the, 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 uh, the lender a clear view of what is appropriate for that customer in terms of uh, any kind of forbearance that you're going to give. The other, the other key thing I think um, from what I've seen in the use of open banking, particularly in the collections world, is always a bit of a challenge to find out what the, the kind of the, the give and the get is on um, using open banking data. I think at the point of acquisition, it's absolutely clear what the customer's going to get. And I think this is a bit of an education at the moment for consumers and customers to understand that by sharing this data, the lenders themselves can give them a much better um, forbearance option based on you know the, the, the true circumstances that they're in. Um, I, I think historically, if that's been seen as a stick to beat somebody with, they're not going to be very keen to share that data. So it's really important that the value of sharing the data and the benefits it brings come through clearly. I think just, just touching on the, the core analysis that you, you went through earlier as well, 
Um, one of the things that we're seeing now is understanding what's behind those calls. So it's one thing that you, you can have a, a fluctuation in the demand, but actually what's driving that fluctuation in the demand, being able to capture that, codify it, and analyze it to a, a lower level of detail, and then to tailor how you treat customers moving forward. So the, the other aspect that we're seeing now is clients coming to us and saying, how do we take all of this data that we're getting as a consequence of the change in uh, core profile of demand and the fact that customers are now using digital tools where they weren't previously and recognizing how that's going to change our operating model moving forward and then also making sure that there's appropriate um, conduct risk management around how those interactions will take place from this point forward as well so we're kind of seeing it from helping cope with the unprecedented demand at the beginning of the process to now Okay, we've got processes in place that are different and they're working, but the regulation and the guidance that's being given is constantly changing. So we're seeing fluctuations in demand as a consequence of that, but we don't necessarily understand how that's going to impact everybody over the course of the next six months. So how do we recognize that quickly and put measures in place to change how we interact with those customers as those demand profiles change? So those are kind of the key things that, that we're seeing at the moment in terms of demand for our, our tools and technology. Interesting. I think it would seem to be the case that uh, over the next kind of six months or so, that it's going to be, become quite vital for um, that understanding for lenders to determine which of their customers require what kind of support, because some may be affected, have fine now, affected heavily later this year, uh, or the reverse might be true. So things might start to ease up for them in terms of income shocks that they've experienced so far. So it would seem to be a fluctuation picture for for many of the uh, creditors and collectors organised organisations out there. So uh, just moving on to uh, some of the other points that we asked in the survey. This was about the speed of adoption and how quickly firms have been able to uh, implement or upgrade software or deploy new software. This is where you get quite a, a wide, disparate range uh, of answers. So. For open banking, which we've just been talking about there, for some firms that's taken up to one month. Uh, for collections case management software, uh, again, can range from a couple of weeks up to one month and automation up to a couple of weeks and the same for uh, DCA panel management tech. So there's one other slide to show you on this. So one thing that one company could brag about there was implementing new call center dialer tech in 24 hours. I mean, that all depends, of course, on uh, what was being actually deployed there. Um, but you can see there, there's quite a, a disparate range of answers there, up to three weeks, for example, for payment technology and for cl compliance and risk technology, up to one month. So some things of elements have presented uh, more challenges than others. And just looking next to some of the barriers to the speed of adoption that companies have been coming up against. So you see there, some of these would be reasonably expected uh, bank systems and red, red tape, internal approval, training of staff, and for some, the eventual arrival of FCA guidance uh, with this guidance coming out in phases by product. So uh, just quick, the one quick question on this, I guess, to um, Probably to Terry again, I guess, because when you've been working to help uh, firms implement or upgrade or consider kind of deployment of new technology, what kind of typical um, obstacles that you're encountering, encountering and how, I guess, if those barriers are lowering this year and kind of how firms are being able to implement slightly faster than, let's say, before lockdown really took effect? Yeah, so in, in, in virtually every implementation, it, it's about the integration. So what is it you need to do in order to facilitate the new digital solutions? Or uh, if you're putting in a, a case management system, what is the core data that you need to have uh, provided into that system? And what, what data needs to be fed from that system into uh, core platforms? So th those are the kind of the, the key drivers. But if I take one example, uh, we're currently looking at um, deploying a, a decision engine uh, for an organization so that they can take a feed of all of their outcome data 
um, and to use the analysis um, of that outcome data via machine learning algorithms to define which segments and cohorts of their base have been more adversely affected. And as um, we, we start to unwind from different safety nets and safety measures, where and when is the reaction likely to be more um, significant? What's going to create greater demand? And how can that demand be preempted, um, whether it's through uh, a pre delinquent activity or some proactive outbound campaign to point customers to, to other help? Um, being able to do that quickly and deploy that quickly has been really, really key uh, for organizations. So understanding how we're gonna get that data out, how we're gonna consume it, and how we're gonna then feed the recommendations back into the client organization. Um, and, and ideally, people want to do that very quickly. Um, and we're talking you know, typically uh, something in place within a matter of weeks rather than a matter of months. Um, but there is always the realism of, what legacy systems are you working with? How complex are those legacy systems? How easy is it to get out the, the core data that you need to facilitate the service that you're going to provide? Um, and those are all the key questions that we kind of go through at the beginning of each engagement. Yeah, okay. I, I guess one, just one last quick question on this because there's still quite a bit, a few more uh, results to get through. Is maybe just one question to you, Nick, is that at Virgin um, have, the, the kind of barriers or the number of hoops you have to jump through for new uh, tech deployment? Have they kind of lowered, have they alleviated somewhat when there's this kind of growing need to, to make those changes at speed? I, I think there's a recognition that the, the, the governance and the controls needs to be there, but they need to act. They need yeah. to be much more responsive. So um, the, the I think there's the recognition that we need to resource to make sure things like digital teams, et cetera, understand the priority of these things. The complexity for us, I think, probably comes more from um, the fact that we've got three different brands, two different heritages, um, multiple systems and multiple products, and trying to get these um, simple digital um, routes and channels into, into operation quickly has been, there's a prioritization and a, and a queue so that's been the only delay just the sheer volume to get through but I, I, I think that it's important that we queue these things up and, and govern them and, and, and manage them in a, in a controlled way and there's a recognition that those hoops need to be easier to get through rather than necessarily removed but I think the other part of it is that um, a lot of these things that we put in place have been by nature temporary in response to a crisis so um, the the controls around taking them back out again um or yeah. making them permanent are the important ones now yeah, okay and just uh, one last point on volume um i can now hopefully share the poll results from earlier so you can see there hopefully at home that 54 uh, percent uh, of you at home are still seeing roughly the same inbound call volumes so quite a significant majority there, 24% seeing higher and only 22% of you seeing uh, lower inbound call volumes from uh, June compared to May. So that challenge is still very much there. It doesn't seem to be alleviating for many of you at home. So just to kind of show you some of the more the granular results um, of questions that we asked, we also asked about deployment of analytics and whether people are using new analytics tools and you can see there nearly 50 percent of respondents are already doing so or likely to in the near future um, it was roughly just over 50 percent and not but even for those people you've got to think that that may likely change uh, in the next uh, few months bearing in mind the fluidity or volumes of customers so just getting through to some of the um gauges of success i guess so for, these are the um the answers for people that are using new analytics tools this is how they've given a score out of 10. so you get some here just like roughly about 12 percent or 11 or 12 percent giving a maximum score of 10 and then quite a few there just around about 36 percent 37 percent uh, giving a bit of an average score of five out of ten, but I guess this will all depend on the nature of the analytics that has been deployed 
and it seems that in many cases it's the internal staff doing things differently and you can see some of the new methods that we used there on the right hand side but if anyone wants to kind of gauge against this after the broadcast i would very much encourage you to uh, to kind of keep an eye out for the recording of the webinar which should be up i think by monday maybe even earlier so just moving on to um some of the other kind of freehand answers that were given during this survey so this is where we asked about how digital engagement had evolved and it has evolved quite rapidly um over the last kind of two to three months so you can see there some of these would be expected really online applications for payment holidays chatbots changed letter suites um letters I, I think being something in the public eye at the moment because of this campaign that's being uh, driven by martin lewis uh, for the consumer credit act to change so that uh, some of the debt collection letters don't have to be sent out to customers where a payment break has already been agreed. So we might see yet another catalyst, I guess, as a result of the pandemic, if uh, the Treasury uh, does actually listen to this campaign and look at where the uh, legislation effectively conspires against customers, not for them. And again, you see here self-serving certification uh, being a big um, key key area of focus, I guess, as along with many of the others. So just coming to the panel on this as well, um, I might come to you first on this, uh, Eric. Uh, I asked how digital engagement has changed, I guess, in any way since since the lockdown took effect, or is it, was that already a big function for your customers anyway? Yeah, I mean, it, it's already, uh, a pretty mature function within the business so that wasn't our our biggest challenge um so you know customers can do most things online already um and i mean we I, mean, I think actually we you know we saw an initial peak initial peak then we saw things drop off and actually we've just set in sort of you know new highs in terms of engagement levels through that channel so it's been it's been mixed depending on you know which which point in time um so yeah not not a big not a big challenge for us that that piece i i did want to pick up though um one of the things that was uh, an interesting challenge earlier in the in the in the event was you know when we got colleagues back home with you know hundreds of new laptops that we purchased very early on in the process was the ability to put a virtual hand up and ask for help uh, that was a that was a challenge um, which we we solved with um, teams actually uh, which was a great way for colleagues to be online talking to customers but at the same time you know being able to engage their team leader and actually ask for help that was really really powerful very easy implementation but uh, really made a difference for colleagues in helping them engage uh, in the way that they would in the office and ask for help and assistance yeah, I think a video calls to actually come up in uh, quite in two or three of the answers, I think, from respondents. Um, so just moving on to another result from the survey, which is kind of brings it back to one of the premises of the webinar, really, which is the, the kind of notion of building a business case for higher budget allocation and collection. So we asked um, all the organisations whether Finally, this is the point in which they are seeing new higher budgets allocated for the collections function now, or if it's coming in the near future. You can see there, between the two last bars there, so yes, more budget will be allocated in future, more budget allocated now, that's more than 40%. And you've got to think that, that had we been asking this question a year ago, that, that 40% proportion may have even been half that, I think, because it's been a perennial uh, issue that's come up in conference debates, which is the extent to which budget allocations don't filter through to collections functions. So I might come at you first on this, Richard. If this period we're in now or this year generally, you're finally seeing the kind of 
um, the budget allocations that helps you deal with all the challenges that you've that you've talked about so far? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's kind of a scenario of, of, of careful what you wish for. Um, I guess for a long time, us in the collections industry, or many of us have, have, have complained about people not paying enough attention to or not giving enough priority to the collections area. Um, and suddenly now, um, you know, pandemic and post-pandemic, uh, everyone wants to hear from the collections guy as to what the thing's going to happen in the future. Um, so, so you're kind of in a situation now where people expect um, us to react, they expect us to have a plan. Um, so of course the, the, the key aspect to always gaining new budget or ga gaining new priority is to try and drive a bit of stakeholder engagement and, and that's come in a forced way due to the pandemic that, that the next question is, you know, how bad will it be? You know, how many will end up in collections? So, so everyone is looking in, in our direction. Of course the downside is that <clears throat> due to the pandemic, any business that has or relies on a sales channel for its income um, has a, a conflicting interest in the sense of generally sales and new business have decreased. So the ability to allocate any budget, let alone more budget, to certain areas is, is obviously has to be looked at again. So people are reforecasting, seeing what the new books look like and, and what, what money you have to go around. And I think you know, certainly all of my time in collections, I've always had a heavy focus on technology and automation, and it's incumbent on anyone who works in collections to see how you can um, do things in a different way than just simply asking for more money or more people. How do you leverage what you've got to be more efficient and to, to, to do things um, more quickly than you have done previously? Um, so I think to, to kind of tie in a previous question, looking at the technology implementation that we've had, again, part of the plan for me and, and what's incumbent on everyone is to, is to use what we've benefited from during the pandemic. We've had enormous registrations for our online account servicing where customers can self-serve, they can register for the online account, view their account, request uh, settlement figures, et cetera, et cetera. So we really need to make sure that we capitalize on that. So any new solution that we drive, any new process that we have must be electronic. You then must be able to self-serve so we can keep that usage at those levels to help in the, you know, in the baseline operations where you need people to outbound dial. You get as many people as you can self-servicing, make sure the forms, the questions, and the information is there for them to self-serve. So you can then focus the time and attention that you do have on the people that need it most. Precisely, and I guess the ways in which whatever technology that you're deploying uh, helps to enhance, I guess, customer retention as well, has that always been a kind of key component of kind of justifying that higher allocation too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you work within a, a captive industry, a, a motor finance, you know, a lender or um, you know, any kind of wholly owned uh, business such as that where your collections and customer management sit in the same in the same world as your new business and onboarding, you have to look after your customer throughout. And again, the, the electronic, the self-servicing um, can only help you to build a better picture of your customer as they move through the life cycle. You know, motor finance has, has long had the uh, issue that you hear very little from the customer, arguably, from start to finish. They, they go and finance their new vehicle, they drive their new vehicle, and then in two or three years' time, maybe four, they want to buy a new vehicle, you might hear from them again. The more opportunity that you have to engage with them throughout the life cycle, the more opportunity that you have to understand their, their position, to understand their intentions, and better management you know, towards the end of the contract to make sure that renewal opportunities is kept you know live and, and, and breathing so, uh, so absolutely yeah and uh, same question to Nick really if you're seeing uh, higher budget allocations in um, at Virgin money uh, in the collections function but what kind of attention that brings with it I guess as well and uh, yeah hugely increased attention um, that uh, from it being a subset of, uh, of automation I have regular intact in, interaction now with the LT and actually the LT 
in the franchise model we operate are accountable for um, understanding the collection, the, the debt profile, the outlook, the delinquency outlook, and the collections performance for their for their products. So I have a lot of attention multiplied by three at the moment, and th yeah. that's positive um, because we're now talking about transformation, not automation. So um, we're talking about how we digitize our services, focused on how you make it better for the customer. That will drive efficiency. That will drive um, business benefit, but it's about how you uh, how you make it uh, a more accessible and easy to operate service, and that will drive colleague benefit. So I can't sit here and say that from a tech deployment we've uh, triumphed with getting colleagues to to work from home, as you can tell from my background. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we're still very much in the office, um, but that's very much the plan. So how do we increase create a flexible workforce because Working digitally, working through digital channels, working remotely gives us more flexibility to support customers at different hours of the uh, hour of the day. Hours of the day it improves the colleague experience. That's going to take a lot of money, um, but there's um, an organisation-wide recognition that it's something we need to do. Not just in collections, but we're very much part of that. It's not we're we're at the front of the queue now rather than the back. I think. Yeah. Okay. Which is progress. Um, so just quickly before, because I've wanted to get Derek's and Terry's views on this as well, I wanted to launch a quick poll uh, to see if what the survey results show were reflected in your own experiences. So I'm just launching this now and just want to get the the same questions uh, answered really. So whether you're uh, being allocated more budget now, uh, whether it's likely to happen in the future, if it's a straight no, if at the moment it's a bit uncertain for you. So for the moment, I'll just leave that poll open. So give a few more, uh, a minute or two for people to fill that out. Uh, so a uh, direct question for you would be, um, if you are looking at new ways into to deploy budget in, whether it's collections, technology or elsewhere, what's for you as a debt purchaser, what is getting most attention at the moment? Um. <clears throat> So, I mean, we, yeah, we've been on a journey of, uh, you yeah, know, being quite sort of technologically focused really for the last, you know, four or five years and uh, have got pretty well teched up, uh, you know, collections operation. But what I think if I was characterizing our uh, next sort of uh, generation of change that we've been working on uh, for the last probably nine months or so is really bringing uh, simplifying the journey for colleagues as they go through processes, so building some new front ends to the tools that they're using. But the really big, powerful piece of that is combining it with the new data that we're that we're bringing to to the business as well. Bringing those two things together means that we can have much deeper, better conversations with customers, find better outcomes for them, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be a, a, a big shift in the performance of the business, but it really is bringing, you know, tech and automation together with the data. That's that's the big change. Okay, and then and lastly, um, Terry, with again with your kind of whole of market view, um, I guess it's more about the nature of inquiries you're seeing, or just with conversations with clients, etc. Where I guess, first of all, if you're seeing them having bigger pockets to deploy, and if they are, what kind of conversations they're having with you about where to deploy it? Yeah, so this is probably the most pleasing slide of all the slides you've shown so far. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in the last, I'd probably say the last four to six weeks, we, we have seen quite an increase in the level of conversations that are taking place, whether it be looking at um, our digital offering, whether it be looking at our analytical offering, or whether it be looking at our case management uh, workflow software offering. And I think things definitely were stalled um, during uh, April, May, um, or May, June, and we definitely have seen uh, a lot of intensity around taking some of these projects forward. One of the things that we do with a lot of our organizations that we work with is, is look at the ROI. So to so the point Richard was making, um, 
you know, you definitely need to understand what the, the actual return is going to be for these investments. Um, there isn't a, a golden bullet, but if you do the due diligence, if you understand where the opportunities are to automate, to, to use data analytics more effectively, drive out better processes and, and manage conduct, conduct risk much more effectively, then you definitely will see a much better operating uh, environment. And um, I think various organizations have, have done various degrees of that, that transformation. Um, some have still got very basic tools and some, as Derek has said, you know, have, have invested quite heavily in automation and digitization. But um, the, the, the data that's coming out of the pandemic and the changes in people's behaviors is happening so quickly. I think if organizations aren't able to capture that data on a day-to-day -day basis, analyze it quickly and recognizing the, the changes in trends that they, they're going to struggle more. Um, so that, that's kind of one of the key things that we're, we're working with clients on is how to do that. Um, I, I'd also be quite interested to see how that uncertain population changes in the next three to six months, because I'm absolutely sure that the demands on the collections department are only going to intensify in that period. Um, so we, we shall see, because it's, it's all unknown, but, um, Exactly, and I think the safety measures that are there in place now are, are gradually going to be taken away, and, and that's going to have its own ramifications. Yeah, and it's for the I guess what is going to be important is ascertaining the duration of um, financial difficulty for lots of customers as well, um, whether it's months or much longer term. So, just to share the results of the poll uh, with the audience, hopefully, this is appearing on people's screens. So not quite as encouraging as the last slide, I'm afraid, Terry, but some people yeah. there, 20% um, saying yes, more budget allocated now, 7% uh, um, more in the future, 33% uncertain. Um, but it's, as you kind of suggested there, those who are uncertain may well be finding themselves with extra capacity, I guess, as well. So just a, uh, one of the last few slides to show is, um, around where budgets will actually be deployed so you can see there people are planning from for a, a kind of hefty capacity increase in staff the second bar in from the right there is the clear winner the collection staff recruitment and then just looking towards the left um third in from the left automation again just improving efficiency with uh whatever is being deployed i guess and collections and case management software just around 12 percent. so that's probably uh, a small note of encouragement there for terry again so uh just a couple of last slides now on general kind of findings so the peak of inbound calls may have passed but the volumes are still very high um lots of activity and focus around payment holiday requests Digital IE &E assessments came up very frequently, and video calls uh, being a very helpful development uh, in this period. Uh, but some of the familiar barriers coming up to the speed of change. And then just um, a few last things uh, more than 40% of firms have already been or about to be allocated higher budgets in collections. Uh, but I guess this will be the year where. Um, the successes of collections operations might be recognised in group companies, maybe more than previously. Uh, and it looks like lots of these budgets going to recruitment automation and just improving the digital journey that much more. So probably just one last question um, for everyone, really. I'll start with Nick, really, which is if you can envisage at this stage the working practices in collections that have changed that will become permanent? I, I think um, the primary one from our point of view is, is remote working. So we're not there, um, but we'll be expanding that. And to the extent we'll be um, relying on colleagues working remotely and working flexibly and much less on a, an office space, the notion of a, a head office or banks of desks with um, people sat at them, I think will be, um, a vanishing reality in the next 12 months for us um, 
and these spaces will turn into much more collaboration spaces where teams come together and work together doing the work will be done um outside and i think that points us much more towards digital services and self-serve to make that to, to enable that to happen so the tech to be able to deliver distribute those calls to record those calls compliantly but putting the customer in the driving seat in terms of being able to access services and fulfill online as well as knowing when to intervene with those agents so um th th those two expansions really of the kind of early steps that we've taken remote working and digitization of some basic services yeah it'd be interesting if offices kind of stop being buildings in which uh, workers are hosted and they kind of become innovation centers um uh richard i guess the next question for you talked about it already really the extent to which your own kind of flexible working practices have really shifted uh, quite significant really it looks like that'll be a permanent fixture yeah absolutely yeah uh, echo what, what nick has said um that the intention from our side is to do the same um to try and leverage what we've learned and what we've shown ourselves um i guess in terms of learnings throughout the pandemic that we want to kind of become a permanent feature and, and trying to take it from a broader view rather than one specific technology or or process is that as we already alluded to in a, in a crisis you kind of you end up compressing the decision structure um, so ideally you maintain the same governance you have the same levels of hierarchy in there but you compress the time it takes for those people to meet together this video technology makes it perfect in the sense of you can have you know as many meetings as you like people are far more available than traditionally are so those decisions have naturally been quicker and it's how we continue to make that happen we're, we're creatures of habit we're creatures of routine and you tend to build your business around committees and meetings and monthly this and quarterly that and, and it actually elongates the process unnecessarily i mean we're, we're all we're all generally look for the weaknesses in things we look to how to improve things we did it in a slide earlier where it said how long have people taken to implement technology and we focused on how could we make that quicker you look at some of the things in there and you're implementing new dialers, new platforms in three weeks. So that's the longest time. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. I mean, you could only, a few years ago, you could only dream of being able to launch those sort of technological features in three weeks. So we have to applaud what we've done already and then focus on how we make that permanent. Not all of it will be permanent because we're not in a crisis. It doesn't need to be that fast all the time. But when we can and when we need to react quickly, let's remember what we learned due to the covid crisis and implement that new structure that compressed structure to help things happen more quickly okay very interesting and, and derek is it any different in the debt purchase world uh not not terribly no um i think work from home uh you know clearly a big part of the future um yeah we did it in literally a couple of days after lockdown was announced we were for everyone that could work from home was working from home um we surveyed our staff quite a lot um about what that's like for them uh, for some people that really is quite challenging not just because of the you know where they live but actually they you know have a significant need for the social interactions um that that work brings as well so it's not for everybody but um, almost everybody wanted uh, some of it, and uh, quite a lot of people wanted, you know, a lot of it in their in their future. So we we think that's a uh, something that we will continue. We haven't yet, you know, designed the new future model, but uh, we'll we'll yeah you know, we'll see that in the you know, a large part of our uh, business operation. I think the the other big thing is just. Yeah, it's demonstrated to us the the power of, of data and making sure that you've got the most timely forms of data that are available um, to, to really power up the conversations with customers and you know, make sure that you're reaching good outcomes for them. So uh, I think those those two things will probably be the two things that are most different in the future. Yeah, okay. And then lastly, same question to you, Terry. It's very different for you, obviously, with without a call center that you have to transition but as a technology provider uh, what do you see uh, the changes being that are a permanent fixture now so definitely, definitely the sh shift to uh, digital using analytics in a much more 
operationally effective way. So a little bit similar to what Derek was saying, being able to consume data, but also to be able to, to look at the insights that you're getting from that data and to then differentiate how you treat customers as a consequence of using that data and insight um, and, and having that pretty much as the heartbeat of the business and not just something that you do periodically. Um, so I see those, those things as fundamental. Um, making sure that the, the whole ecosystem for collections is modern, efficient, and is, is ticking really, really well and can adapt quickly when things change. Okay, thanks guys. Well, just coming to our Q&A session now, but I'm conscious that I'm eating into uh, people's lunch breaks. So um, there are a few questions that have come in and I think quite a few of them relate to analytics. So what I can do actually is ask uh, the panelists to come back to people individually because there are some kind of technical aspects there uh, people are asking about what constitutes success uh, in the deployment of analytics so Terry that might be one for you to come back with a fuller answer but you can see we're at all right hour and 20 minutes and we we've covered most of the developments in the market but the volume and scale and speed with which things have changed it's difficult to kind of surmise it just even in this session uh, but thanks very much uh, to our panelists to derek uh, nick and richard and especially to terry and all the team at qualco that helped us put the survey together uh, what i'll uh, what we'll do is notify all the audience of when a recording uh, of this and the slides will be available on the credit strategy website but one thing to note is that for any of you listening with success stories about transitioning uh, we have launched a continuity a business continuity category in our ccs awards which we do still plan to uh, host uh, as a physical event much later this year with government policy and, and safety measures permitting so we do want to kind of cultivate those success stories and publish them because as you saw from uh, some of those results installing dialers etc in 24 hours probably deserves some kind of public spotlight on them because some of the, those in operational roles probably have been working phenomenal hours and phenomenal speed too but thanks everyone for listening keep a lookout for the recording and we'll see you soon thank you thank you Martin. thank you yes. Yes, I'm just going to close it now.